the Leon Panetta 2016 Lecture Series, an America in Renaissance or Decline, the challenges facing a new president. This lecture discusses gridlock, partisanship, and executive action. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mrs. Sylvia Panetta. Good evening, everyone. Welcome once again to the Sunset Cultural Center in beautiful Carmel-by-the-Sea for the Leon Panetta 2016 Lecture Series. We are now more than halfway through this year's season on whether or not the future will bring in America in Renaissance or in America in decline and the challenges facing a new president. Tonight, we turn our focus to gridlock, partisanship, and executive action. James Madison and the other founders intentionally designed a sharply limited government. They created a system of checks and balances to prevent centralizing powers in any one branch of government. It is a system that requires that we elect to work together. And when our leaders don't, then gridlock is the result. Today, the President and the Congress, Republicans and Democrats, are so divided that they're unable to govern. They cannot find consensus on major issues facing this nation, on immigration reform, the budget, funding infrastructure, trade, and war authority. They are now divided over how to address the vacancy on the Supreme Court. How did we get to this state of affairs? And more importantly, how can we reverse this dangerous trend? Can a new president and the Congress work together to govern our nation? Can the next president break the gridlock, or are we in for four more years of paralysis? What role will executive orders play in a new administration? Do we need to reform campaign financing and the redistricting process? Tonight, these topics will be discussed by some of the nation's most respected political analysts and journalists. Among them, they have worked as staff to presidents, managed presidential campaigns, and held elected office. Tonight, we'll ask them to look at the current state of our political system, the impact of this historic campaign, and where we go from here. Can our democracy regain its vitality? How do we make this happen? Our first guest. Our first guest has worked in Washington throughout the administration of 10 United States presidents. He served in the United States Marine Corps before going to Washington in 1965 for U.S. Senator William Proxmire. In 1968, he joined Robert Kennedy's presidential campaign and later held leadership positions in three other presidential campaigns. For 11 years, he helped manage campaigns from the courthouse to the White House in some 38 states. In 1979, he turned his focus to journalism and began writing his now nationally syndicated column for the Washington Post. In 1988, he became a moderator and a panelist on Capital Gain, CNN's landmark political debate program, and spent 17 years on this show. Today, he continues his 28-year post at PBS NewsHour, providing weekly political analysis and commentary on national campaigns. Additionally, he is a regular panelist on Inside Washington, the weekly public affairs broadcast on ABC and PBS. He is the author of the well-received book, On the Campaign Trail which detailed the 1984 presidential campaign between Walter Mondale and Ronald Reagan. An experienced and distinguished commentator, please welcome back Mark Shields. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Our second 
second guest is a former member of Congress, author, ordained Baptist minister, businessman, and celebrated collegiate football player. Elected to Congress representing Oklahoma's 4th Congressional District in 1994, just four years later in his term, he was named chairman of the Republican Com Conference, the fourth ranking leadership position in the majority party. He served for eight years on the House Armed Services Committee and authored legislation to create the House Select Committee on Homeland Security, which became the law and on which he later served. He also served on the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, as well as the Banking Committee. He co-authored the Community Renewal and New Markets Act, which President Bill Clinton signed into law in 2000. Additionally, he was the author of President George W. Bush's Faith-Based Initiative, the Community Solutions Act of 2001. Deciding not to sit, seek a fifth term in Congress, he is now chairman of a Washington, D.C.-based multi-industry company with diverse holdings that includes the first African-American-owned John Deere dealership in the United States and public affairs consulting company. He is the author of two best-selling books, including the autobiography, What Color is Conservative? My Life and My Politics. Please welcome J.C. Watts. Thank you all again for having me. My pleasure. Our next guest is senior political analyst for CNN, known for her hard-hitting analysis of policy issues and political developments. She began her career as a reporter at the Washington Star in 1979. During the next three decades, she served as a political columnist for U.S. News and World Report, chief congressional correspondent for Newsweek, co-anchor of CNBC's Capitol Report and national political correspondence for CBS News. She joined CNN in 2007 and now serves the network's senior political analyst appearing regularly across the network's primetime programs. She plays an instrumental role in the network's daily coverage while reporting on a variety of political and breaking news stories. She has been a prominent part of all recent CNN election coverage, and she was pivotal to CNN's Emmy Award-winning election night coverage in 2012. She also played roles in the network's political coverage for the 2010 midterm elections, as well as the historic coverage of America Votes 2008. This earned CNN a George Peabody Award. During Secretary Panetta's time in Washington, Ms. Borger stepped in as moderator for several Panetta Institute lecture series discussions on politi politics and the campaigns. An experienced political analyst, please welcome Gloria Borger. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Thank you. One of television's most recognizable political journalists, our final guest, has been following an American politics since the first Eisenhower campaign. He served in Africa in the Peace Corps before beginning his career in politics. He was staff assistant to the Senate Budget Committee until 1977, and later a speechwriter for President Jimmy Carter, and a top aide to Speaker of the House, Tip O'Neill. In the late 1980s, he became the Washington Bureau Chief for the San Francisco Examiner. He began his career in television in 1994, and three years later, he launched Hardball, an hour-long daily news show filled with in-depth political analysis and fiery debate that airs on MSNBC. He has been on the air every weeknight since. Recently, he and fellow political talk show host Rachel Maddow teamed up to an anchor MSNBC's primetime convention coverage. 
the pair joined forces again to cover election night 2012. He is the author of six best-selling books. This includes his most recent, Tip and the Gipper, When Politics Worked. This describes how Republican President Ronald Reagan and Democratic House Speaker Tip O'Neill overcame their own political ideologies and worked together for the benefit of the country. He not only analyzes the news in recent weeks, he has made news. Please welcome Chris Matthews. <laughs> And finally, of course, moderating the discussion is the man who created this lecture series 19 years ago. With more than 50 years in public service, he knows firsthand the importance of bipartisan cooperation and believes that working across the aisle brought about legislative accomplishments such as the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary and the 1997 Bipartisan Budget Agreement. Please welcome Secretary Leon Panetta. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to this, our third forum of the Panetta Lecture Series. Our theme has been an America in renaissance or an America in decline? The challenges facing my new president of the United States. We've talked about terrorism, uh, foreign policy. We've talked about the economy. Tonight we're going to talk about an area that is fundamental to any president. The ability to be able to get things done. The ability to break the gridlock in Washington, uh, and really be able to accomplish things on behalf of this country. Like the members of the distinguished panel that we have this evening, uh, we've seen Washington at its best, and we've seen Washington at its worst. Uh, the good news is we've seen Washington work. We've seen Republicans and Democrats work together on the key issues facing this country. The bad news is that in 50 years of public life, I've never seen Washington as dysfunctional as it is today. So a new president, on entering the Oval Office, is going to have to confront this challenge. And the question is going to be, can that individual make Washington work for the benefit of the American people, or are we in for another four years of paralysis, which would be damaging to the future of our country. So that's the issue we'll explore this evening, along with a few other interesting issues that seem to be going on today. Uh, but let me, let me start with the first question. Uh, if uh, a new president gets elected uh, and calls you up and asks you to the Oval Office and basically says to you, uh, look, uh, I want to be able to break this crazy gridlock, this dysfunction in Washington, because I really want to be able to get things done. Uh, you know, all of you have had your own experience in Washington. Uh, Mark Shields uh, worked for Senator Proxmire uh, when I was uh, working on the Hill. Uh, he's seen Washington work. Chris Matthews worked for Tip O'Neill uh, and uh, wrote a book on uh, Tip O'Neill and uh, Ronald Reagan working together. Gloria Borger uh, used to cover uh, the Hill during the days when it did work together, so she's familiar with Washington working. And J.C. Watts uh, was elected in 94, and even though it was a tougher time, the fact was that Bill Clinton was working with Newt Gingrich uh, and was able to get things done for the country, welfare reform, budget uh, agreements, et cetera. So they've all seen Washington work. So if a president calls you into the Oval Office and says, what do I need to do in order to be able to break this gridlock and govern, what advice would you give him? I would tell my husband to stop kidding around and get off the phone. <laughs> I'm not so sure the president would be calling me, but go ahead. 
Well, that's true. That's true. <laughs> Mark? Um, thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. It's uh, great to be here. Leon and I both worked on Capitol Hill on the Senate side uh, some half century ago, uh, when in fact it did, it literally did work. Um, and I, uh, uh, I guess I, I would say, uh, even though I, I worked for Democrats, uh, including Robert Kennedy in, here in the California primary in 1968, uh, that the model I would follow would, would be that of Ronald Reagan. Um, and uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, first of all, hired as his chief of staff uh, a person who would run the last two campaigns against him, Jim Baker. Jim Baker had run George Bush's campaign against Reagan for the 1980 nomination uh, when voodoo economics was uh, first applied to Reagan's uh, ideas and run Gerald Ford's campaign in 1976, uh, which was a bitter fight when Ronald Reagan failed to get the nomination in Kansas City. Uh, he reached out and had that level of personal security and comfort in his own skin that he could ask Jim Baker uh, to, uh, to be his chief of staff. And uh, Baker, uh, present company accepted, was, uh, was the, uh, the quintessential chief of staff in terms of mastery of policy, politics, and, and uh, the press. Uh, but I, I'd say about Ronald Reagan is that he had about him a comfort level and an ability to laugh at himself. Um, if there's one thing the next president better have is a likability uh, with, uh, in dealing uh, with uh, not simply the American public, but we, we in Washington don't make anything. All right, let's get that straight, okay? We don't grow crops. Uh, we, we don't build computers. Uh, we don't build airplanes. We don't even make movies. Uh, so in Washington, when you have trouble measuring output, our tendency is to measure input. Uh, so what did you do yesterday, Mark? Hey, I was here at 7 in the morning. What did you do? I didn't leave till 6.30 last night. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I, can't tell you, I can't tell you what I did, but I can tell you how long I didn't do it. <laughs> and, and so, you know, we, we, get, we get a little bit puritanical about, you know, people spending long hours in the office. Uh, Jimmy Carter, God bless him, was in the office before it breakfast and not frequently there until midnight. Ronald Reagan came and he, he kept banker's hours. He was not in the office before 9.30. He was never in the office after 4.30. So we in the press who are just a pain in the neck started getting out. Is he really up to the job and this and that? So the first off the record dinner Ronald Reagan has with reporters, he stands up and he says, you know, they tell me hard work never killed anybody, but I figured why take the chance? <laughs> And, <laughs> so once he had once he had laughed at his own alle alleged foible, you know it absolutely disarmed his critics. I mean, we looked like common skulls, and it, it's just a great, great strength. Uh, I would I just add to that the the advice that uh, uh, the first piece of advice I'd say you you want a piece of legislation to first out of the box that is important, uh, that there is consensus upon, and I would say what you want most of all is a national infrastructure bill uh, that, would, that would rebuild this country. Uh, and I, I think you'd get bipartisan support, and I think it would be in the national interest, and it would be so refreshing to see people in both parties working together. JC? Mr. Secretary, I too want to thank you for allowing me to be with uh, my buddies here on, on stage at the Panetta Institute, thank you and Sylvia and the staff for showing us a delightful time today. Um, you know, I, I am an optimist by nature. You know, I'm the kind of guy that I'd go after Moby Dick in a rowboat and take the tartar sauce with me. I mean, that's, <laughs> that, that's, that's just kind of my nature. But I, I, I somehow know that, that optimism has been tempered over the last eight or nine months. I would say if, if, if the president called me, uh, say, Madam President, uh, <laughs> Mr. Uh, I, I won't get that call, but I assume that I'll say, Mr. President, if, if, uh, if, if I was to get that call, I'd say you can't, 
Washington has become very dysfunctional, and there's 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 no tragedy in being dysfunctional. We all are dysfunctional. It's just a matter of degree. I'm probably more dysfunctional than Mark. He's probably more dysfunctional than Gloria. Chris is more dysfunctional than all of us. So, <laughs> but, never, but nevertheless. The, the tragedy in life is not that we are dysfunctional. The tragedy in life is when we allow our dysfunction to become our normal. And, and unfortunately, dysfunction has become the normal in Washington, and I don't think you solve dysfunction with dysfunction. And I think we've become so concerned about the left wing and, and the right wing that the poor bird is dying and and I wish I, I had a solution other than to say that um, I, I think we've lost sight of of who we are as a nation and I think it helps us to kind of go back to basics to remind ourselves that my wife last summer we were driving from Oklahoma to Virginia where a domicile is and we went through my hometown and I said hey we're 13 miles away let's go through old neighborhood and we stopped and got us some ice cream and we were driving through the old neighborhood and I looked over on the porch and, and I saw a fella sitting over there on the porch that was kind of sweet on my wife when we were in high school <laughs> and I told her I said and, and just this came to me this witty thought and I voiced it and I said if you'd have married him you'd have been sitting over there on that porch <laughs> And she said, I mean, quickly responding, she said, if I'd have married him, he'd have been the congressman. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you, you've got, so I, I say that to say, you got to know who you are. And I really, I, I really think we, we have lost sight on, on who we are. We're not talking about the future. In, in, in the presidential race. I would say, mm -hmm. Mr. President, Madam President, talk about the future. Mm -hmm. Talk about where you want to, your vision for the country and where you want to take us and how you're going to, how are you going to get us there? We, we don't have presidential candidates today talking about the future. If you want to know about the future, you've got to tune in and what Google's doing, what, what, uh, uh, Microsoft is doing what what you know the Facebook guys are doing or what Apple is doing. Yeah. They're they're talking about the future, and and we are that close. I think to to finding a cure for cancer, and and we have become so dysfunctional that we're talking we're not talking about building our, our infrastructure, rebuilding our infrastructure. We're not talking about solving educational crisis. We're not talking about. Uh, you know, d d defending our nation, we're talking in sound bites. And again, I would say to the president, don't allow your dysfunction to become your normal. Be above that. Get above it. We've got to do that. Gloria? First of all, I want to defend Chris Matthews. He's not that dysfunctional, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I <I'm kidding. laughs> Okay, let me just say something about Chris. Chris and I go back a long way because Chris was press secretary for Speaker O'Neill and I was the kid hanging out in the outside office uh, talking to Chris Matthews who knows more about politics in his pinky than I will ever know. So I will tell That's you right. uh, that I learned uh, from Chris Matthews. Um, one of the things that I would say, uh, if asked, and that is, uh, first of all, don't over interpret your mandate. Uh, you have to think big, but lots of times people get elected president and they think their margins were <clears throat> larger than they really were, and their congressional margins are different, and they overinterpret. And each president I've covered believes that they're going to be transformational. Some of them will be transformational, some not so much. So that's, you know, that's number one. And the second thing I would say is, understand the enormity of every word you speak because we're mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a pundit right there's no enormity I'm just trying to do my job and every day I tell you what I know and what I've reported when you're president of the United States every mm -hmm. word counts okay. and and you cannot and you know chargers are going to be flying back and forth during this campaign it's not going to be pretty once you set foot in that Oval Office, the tone has to change. 
and the restraint has to change um, because everybody around the world, and Secretary Panetta knows this better than anyone, every word you say matters and it reverberates throughout the entire world and we, we can't forget it. Chris? You know, I think it's, it's such a big question. Um, I worked for Tip O'Neill for six years, and uh, by the way, thank you for that. Yeah, that's um, true. <laughs> uh, and it was different. <clears throat> I mean, when Reagan was shot, just to give you a little story, we'll remember, uh, Reagan was shot, and uh, Mrs. Reagan uh, was concerned because uh, her husband almost died. The bullet was right here. And they're lucky because uh, Jerry Parr, the Secret Service agent, got him to the hospital in three minutes, which was amazing and saved his life. Uh, but the trouble is Strom Thurmond snuck in to see Reagan when he was very bad, in very bad shape. Remember Thurmond? <laughs> Nobody's favorite. And um, <laughs> he was somebody's favorite because we called him Sperm Thurmond because he was having kids in his 80s. <laughs> so, uh, see, I figured out this audience. So I, I, I finally figured you out after some thought here. Uh, so uh, a little pathos here. So. Jim Baker was so smart. Mark knows all this business. And Jim Baker was a brilliant choice. He was a very waspy, elite guy. He went to prep school and all that stuff. But he, he knew he was a staff guy. He knew the job wasn't chief. Mm -hmm. Don Reagan, Reagan later on thought he was chief. No, chief of staff. <laughs> you worked for the guy who was elected. And Jim wasn't elected. He tried it once. He ran for attorney general of Texas and right. got the taste of it enough to know yep. he didn't win. You begin to respect guys who do win. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, so Jim Baker and Nancy Reagan, who I really got to like at the end of her life, because her husband had Alzheimer's, I was saying my mom had, we got to be very friendly. And she said, uh, why don't we let the first person to see my husband should be the leader of the opposition. This is how times were different back then. They understood the importance of that signal. And so Tip goes in to see Reagan, and he was in much worse shape than he thought he'd be because they'd sort of covered up how dangerous it was. So Tip, I knew one guy, Max Friedersdorf, he was a press relations guy for the Republicans, told me this story. He went in there and Tip gets down on his knees next to Reagan. He holds both his hands and they recite the 23rd Psalm together. He's watching all this. And then he kisses Reagan and says, I don't want to keep you. That, uh, that we're all in this together mood that that captured, I think, powerfully, is missing. You know, I just don't think they feel like they're all in this together. They don't feel like, you know, we could have an immigration bill. We live out here, around here in California, immigration, let's get it straight. Like every decent country in the world, why can't we have a law we believe in, we think it's American? the law, and we enforce it. Figure out what's American, pass it, and enforce it. What is wrong with this country? Why can't it do it? You know why? Because the Republicans want one piece of it. They want the cheap labor. The Democrats want the votes. Nobody wants anything to get done. They love dysfunction. It's not an accident they keep screwing up in Washington. They're not, they're not clumsy. They know what they're doing. And when they vote for nothing, they want nothing. This is what they often want. So. It's not an engineering problem, it's a guts problem and a morality problem. Do you want to do the right thing and get it over with? So my advice to a president would be find a deal you can strike that's useful to the other side as well as your side and help the other side sell it. Don't sit and sell it to your side, that's easy. So help the other guy sell it to his party. So if I was going to sell immigration reform to Republicans, I'd say real enforcement, real enforcement. Number two, real enforcement, illegal hiring. Really do it. If, you're gonna, if you don't believe in that, don't pass that. But if that's what you believe in, pass it and enforce it. Now, it sounds so rough. Oh, we're actually going to do something? It's so, it's so crude. We're actually going to do something. And that's what they're afraid of, is doing something. And uh, Mark is right. Measure hours, don't measure output. Because you can't measure out because they don't ever do anything. And you're right. The only thing we do in Washington is deals. So get the deal right. So I think getting deals right, don't think you have common ground, trade. You want something, I want something, let's put it together. We do it in marriage all the time. All the time, it's deal making. Every day it's a deal. We, got, we, we live in deals. You know, we're gonna go visit your relatives. Well, can't we, be, we've been with your relatives for the last year, can't we go visit mine once in a while? All right, I guess you have a point. You can go see them, but I can't go. You know, and so, I mean, I just, but you deal all the time to keep the other person happy because if the other person's happy, you're not happy. It, it is a deal. And I think now it's all like, how can you screw the other party and make sure they don't get anything done? That's what it, it used to be. One party looked out for the other party, make sure they didn't steal the money. Now it's make sure they don't get anything done. The last thing you want is Obama to get credit for uh, 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 immigration reform. Can't let him have that. 
So we have the Hastert rule. Well, that's a good thing, by the way. Keep remembering that guy. Uh, let's observe the Hastert rule. Let's, let's, let's make that beatific, the Hastert rule. Let's make sure we never allow anything to come to the floor that doesn't have the support of one of the parties, the majority party. So therefore, we never have anything that might have a Democratic support. It might have a majority support. That's what they do. They don't pass anything now unless it has passed the Hastert rule. So there are all these games to play not to do anything. I think respect the other side's leader, find deals, find deals, and accept the urgency. Things have to get done. And we have a debt now because we never dealt with it. And that's why young people today can look forward to a government that spends most of its money paying off debt. And that's why Bernie's doing well, because he can promise everything, but they can't pay it because all we have to do is pay our debts first. You know, we're basically in, we're in receivership. We are, as a country, in terms of military, defense, uh, entitlements, and interest rate, you're almost done the budget with that. That's the problem we get into, because they don't deal with things. So anyway, urgency, respect the other side, and find a deal. That's what you're there for. The only thing we do in Washington is pay deals. Find a deal. You know, I used to think that Congress was a crisis-activated institution, as in it would act if there were a crisis. And I grew up covering Capitol Hill, believing that in the end, people like Leon Panetta would come through and go to the table and, and cut a deal. I no longer believe that. Because we have gone through crisis after crisis after crisis where Congress should have been activated and it doesn't do anything. As a result, we have no budget. We just have these across the board cuts that, that, that take no, uh, uh, you, you don't set priorities anymore in spending in this country. And, you know, as a result, people just kind of sit back because they've, they can kick the can down the road and there's no health pay for it. Gloria, you know, on that point, when I was in Congress, and, t and Tip felt this as well, governing was good politics. Mm -hmm. Even though you're working with a Republican president, if you're governing, it's good politics for you. And it was. Mm -hmm. Democrats held their majority because we were governing. Uh, I'm not so sure that they think that governing is good politics. They don't. No, no, no. That, that confrontation uh, and stopping the other party is better politics. Right. You play, right? You play defense. Scoring points. Yeah. Jim Wright, you, uh, Jim, not Jim Wright, Jim Baker, the speaker, you talked about Mark, you're so smart. He would come up to Tip O'Neill, the leader of the opposition, and secretly go back, remember that back room Tip had, that mm -hmm. one with all the mm -hmm. knickknacks on it and all that, but no windows? He'd go back in that room and tell him everything was coming as a courtesy. So the Tip O'Neill was never caught off, off guard. He, knew, he, he respected him. And Tip, on the other hand, not necessarily because they do this because they're generous, but they think it's good politics. Tip, when Reagan first got elected, and Mark, you pointed out he knew what he was doing, Tip said, there'll be no obstruction. We'll have a right. vote. We'll get this over with. He didn't think it would work. That's why he wanted to have a vote. But he wanted everything Reagan wanted to be voted on. And that first year, we did the tax cut, the spending cut, the budget. Everything was on schedule. Tip said, we're going to keep to the schedule. Now, who does that now? There's he no says, control. let's make sure the other side gets a shot. No. He said, the president's gotten elected, he deserves his day in court, and he gave it to him. You know, you, we, you, you, you have a speaker today, Chris, that can't even get his own party's bills up. I mean, Paul Ryan can't even get his own bills up. John Boehner couldn't even get Republican uh, bills up. And, and it has become more about scoring points and making the other person, other team look bad than it is about trying yeah. to you know, move, move the ball. So, well, uh, I, I mentioned uh, the next president. Uh, let's talk about who will be the next president. Um, <laughs> this has been a wild year. And it's politics. down to two. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the next six months are probably going to be even crazier. Uh, I mean, it looks like the likely candidate will be uh, Donald Trump on the Republican side and Hillary Clinton. Uh, on the uh, Democratic side. I mean, they still, you know, Trump is trying to unify the party or maybe not unify the party. Uh, and Hillary still has to uh, get past, uh, close the door on Sanders uh, to be able to do it. But let's assume, for the sake of argument, that uh, it is uh, Trump versus uh, Hillary Clinton, who both have high negatives. Uh, we're going to uh, November. Is November going to be a blowout? in the election, uh, or is it going to be a close election? Mark? It'll be one or the other. <laughs> 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 I, 
I mean, Leon's asking the man who predicted President Dukakis would not seek a second term. <laughs> you know, my, my, uh, my credentials as a prophet are, are a little tarnished. Uh, but, uh, no, I mean, I, I, I really do think uh, that it, at a level, American, American people uh, have a sense of what a president is and who a president is. Um, and uh, Bill Clinton uh, failed that test uh, in the Monica Lewinsky thing. I mean, when you, you know, when, you know, you had to get children out of the room when the news was being covered, you know, the, the, trying to explain to a child that fellatio was a Roman soldier. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Say sperm. I can say the right? <laughs> But and there was, there was a sense, and so George W. Bush in 2000 runs on the basis I'll restore dignity to the Oval Office. I mean that I will not embarrass you. I'll do it. But Americans have, uh, and this is not a, a denigration of Clinton's presidency, which was, you know, in many respects the the last successful, really successful presidency the country's had domestically. Um, you know, 20. Three million jobs created in eight years, and, and the balanced budget that JC mentioned. Um, but the the reality is that I think voters have a sense. Ronald Reagan passed that test in 2000 uh, when there were doubts about him. Uh, Jimmy Carter passed it in 1976 when people didn't know him well. But Americans have a sense of who a president is and what a president must be. Um, in, the, in the final analysis, the president is the only elected official we all vote for. Um, and uh, that he, yes, he or she is the leader of a party, but most of all, the leader of the nation, beyond the government, you're the, you're the national leader. We don't have a, a monarchy that reigns. Uh, we ask a president to do it all. The first family is the first family. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a rather unique job description. I, as an aside, I have to say, I do like people who run for political office. Um, and that, that, that is considered heresy by some people in our profession. I mean, uh, the, most of us in life have lives of quiet success and quiet failure. If you and I are the final two contestants at challenges to be the regional sales manager of the Great Lakes Coat Hanger Company, and you get the job and I don't, when the local paper announces your promotion, they don't say Shields was passed over because of lingering doubts about his expense account or uh, <laughs> his erratic behavior at the company Christmas party. <laughs> but in politics, it's there for everybody who ever sat next to in study hall, double data with, babysat for, to know whether you win or more likely you lost. And uh, I have always admired candidates who could lose with grace and dignity and. In my 50 years in the business, I never saw anybody do it better than the fellow in this very state, in a Los Angeles state senate race when Dick Tuck lost in a very close, close race in a radio reporter from KMPC Radio, just as the results were announced, stuck a microphone in his face and said, Mr. Tuck, how do you feel? And he said, the people have spoken, the bastards. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 come, I, I come back to, to that, that sense that uh, the, uh, <laughs> I'll, so, talk, I'll talk to you. So is this going to be a blowout or close? <laughs> I, I, I come back to the sense that Americans at the core will find Donald Trump not presidential, whether regardless of what he says or irrespective of what he does, um, that the, they do expect a president to be someone whom you don't have to shunt the children or the, the grandparents out of the room <coughs> when he's about to speak. Uh, he's, a, he's a man, if you took the first person singular pronoun out of his vocabulary, would speak less than Calvin Coolidge. Uh, it's I, me, my, 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 me, my, I, I. Uh, and a, a president, what, what we look for in a president is a sense of we, who we are as a people, what we might become as a people, uh, what our challenges are as a people. And not are, are am I better off, but are we better off? Are the, are the weak among us more secure? Are the strong among us more just? And I, I think that's, I, I think for that reason, 
Donald Trump will fail the test of American president, regardless of issues or, or whatever. I do throw in one caveat, and that is between now and November, there will be a major crisis unanticipated, whether it's domestic, economic, uh, whether it's a natural disaster, whether it's a, a, a terrorist attack or an international uh, conflagration, I don't know. But again, that's when Americans will measure the, uh, the, the two aspirants, the two challengers. JC, you're the Republican here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I should get overtime pay tonight. Uh, <laughs> you know, Mr. Secretary, I, I wish I could tell you who I, who I thought was going to win. I, I, I really don't know. We're seeing things in this election that I don't think any of us can say we've, we've seen before. I, there, there's some things that would tell me that uh, Mr. Trump's going to have some real issues and, and just you know, the way he's gone through the field of 1,702 candidates, I, 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 I wouldn't, uh, I, I'd never count him out. Uh, but if you're know, taking off my Republican cap and putting on, you know, my political strategist or my operative cap and saying, okay, how do you get there? How do you create addition and, and, and add numbers to your, your vote count? I, I just think it's it's challenging for him. Um, I, I think most people, seven, eight out of ten people, like to vote for candidates they feel like likes them. Hmm. And and when you consider that um, uh, Mr. Trump has offended almost every demographic out there, <laughs> and with another six months in, in in the election, if you've not been offended, just Stand by, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I just, I, I find it difficult how you can get to 50 plus one. I, I just, I, I think it's going to be very, very uh, challenging for him. I, so, I, I don't know, I don't know who wins, um, and and I wouldn't be surprised. I, I. I, I I wouldn't count him out. I think I think really? the odds are against him okay. um, to to win. But I, I would not, as I said, I would not. Do you think count he likes? Do you think he likes you? <laughs> well, <laughs> Mark, flip a coin. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> I, I, you know, but you know, he's 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 done things that. Um, he's offended women. Uh, he kind of lost me on the Carly Fiorina thing. I, I don't think she deserved that. Uh, what the the way he, um, you know, went after her and um, you know, Muslims, um, uh, African American, uh, Latinos, you know, Latinos. I mean, you name it. He, he's not left any anybody out, and I just think that I think that creates serious. Serious Problems. challenges for him uh, in in an election year, and and I think uh, Senator Clinton, you know, the only thing she's got going for her is that Donald Trump is the nominee. And so, um, so it, you know, we we are in dire straits in, in terms of presidential candidates. Gloria, I would have to say though, uh, be careful what you wish for, uh, because. The, and the and the Hillary Clinton people know this. And talking to them, you know, they're not doing dances about the fact that they would be running against Donald Trump. They understand that these are two historically unpopular candidates. They understand that he has a 70 percent disapproval rating with women, which would mean that he'd have to win an inordinate amount of white one, men. They understand that the Democrats start out with an electoral college advantage. They get it. Let's just put all of that aside. Nothing has been predictable in this campaign. Mm -hmm. And the Trump people I talk to believe that he can bring out voters in, uh, for in states that, that are, we assume would be Democratic, which would be Pennsylvania, Michigan, Michigan maybe Ohio, depending who, he, depending who he runs with. And so they believe that they have a shot at it. And one, one way I think of this election is 
that I call it, this is not going to be a persuasion election. It's going to be a mobilization election. It seems to me that this is going to be about getting your people to the polls. It's not going to be so much about persuading, because how many people do you know are on the fence? Hillary Donald, Hillary Donald. <laughs> They're very different. And um, it's going to be about whether Trump can bring out those people who came out for him in the primaries and then some. And don't forget, these are historically high uh, voting populations in the primaries among Republicans and whether Hillary Clinton can bring out her own voters as well, including some of those people that feel like he has insulted uh, them. And I think that's what it's going to come down to, which is the old fashioned get out the vote, get your people to the polls, and then we'll see. So I'm kind of ducking the question because I really honestly have given up predicting anything uh, in this campaign. <laughs> but, I, but, but also let me add, see, I, I think Mr. Trump has an additional problem with demographics and one of the de yeah. another demographic that he has trouble with, I think, are many Republicans. That's for sure. I, I think there are a lot of Republicans that, and, and I've, I've been a part of a, an email thread that I've not weighed in on, but about one time in three weeks that, I mean, this group of people, and it's very broad, that they are saying, no way Trump. But would they vote for Hillary Clinton or no, just not vote? they wouldn't vote. Right. I mean, they, they they'd, go, vote. Vote, they'd, they'd yeah. go to the polls and vote down line, mm -hmm. which, I mean, that's kind of the argument that they're making, you know, mm -hmm. write in a candidate or go, go to the polls and, and, and vote on your down line because that's one of the arguments that Republicans have made is to say if you stay at home, it's, our down line is going to suffer. Our Senate candidates, our House candidates, our county commission candidates, our, you know, et, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. But it, it's not just... You know, Hispanics, um, you know, black um, uh, women, et cetera, et cetera. You've got an additional problem with there are many Republicans that say he's 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 a problem. Chris, how's it shaking? I think the uh, uh, October surprise is going to be the president. I think he's going to campaign like mad for Hillary because he needs to because his legacy is at stake and it's fragile he wants to save Obamacare he wants to save his le his record on everything from voting rights to everything else and Hillary will do it for him it's an interesting deal I think it's already been sewed up so he'll campaign like gangbusters all mm -hmm. through October uh, he'll bring out the minority vote like mad because it's easier to campaign for somebody else than yourself it's more fun and I think you're going to see an amazing uptake uh, Obama, because he's been out of the limelight politically, he's up to the mid-50s now in acceptability or pr approval. He's really come up, and it always happens when you get out of the political limelight, and, and it, the candidates have taken that limelight away from him. So he's gotten more popular. He'll be more popular if the economy just does what it's doing right now through uh, September. He'll come out there campaign like mad for her. Uh, she's not a great campaigner. We know that. Bill Clinton's a little tired at it, but she'll be good at it with him. I think it's going to be a hell of a political pair. And I think she'll win handily. And the reason she'll win, because people will say, I'm not taking this big chance on Trump. It's too big a chance. And Hillary's not exciting, but she's, 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 she's predictably what she is, which we've watched her for 20, 30 years. She's at two notches to the right of the president on foreign policy, which bugs me. I wish she was just a notch. She's much more hawkish, but people want a little more hawkish, I think. That's a little more. A little more. And on domestic policy, she's about where he is. I don't think Bernie's where the country is. If you're a student with a loan, he's where you're at. But <laughs> you're a parent with a student with a loan. But generally, I think he's, he's the president's about a little left of the country by a notch or two. But I think Hillary will sort of fit in the right spot. Not exciting. She'll be great in the debates because she's always great if the questions are predictable. She's brilliant at predictable questions. Uh, Trump will say wild things, but you can't come into one of these presidential debates with that hair and and, uh, <laughs> and and there's no applause, really. There's no big loud 
you know, peanut gallery kind of a place, a little smattering of it. He doesn't, that won't be the circus he likes to be in. Hillary will like it. It'll be very PBS. You know what I mean, Mark? I do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chris. I know you intended that as a compliment. <laughs> but, well, no, I wouldn't be alive if it was a PBS world, but that's all right. Uh, no, but it'll be very sober, serious, and Hillary will be great. At it. She's very smart. And you watch her getting prepared by people. I know who they are, Bob Barnett, and people like they all sit down with her. And she's great at it. And I don't think it's going to be a lot of crazy questions. So I think she'll do very well. And he'll seem a little strange at some point this, this fall. But all that said, I do think Trump was on to something big this year, really big. He had something to say. His opponents had nothing to say. And I, he, had, he talked to the American people. You may not like the way he talked. He said terrible things, dunce cap stuff, like, like Rafael Cruz was involved with killing Jack Kennedy. Horrible things he said. Mm -hmm. And that's something a head of state in this country, that's one of the titles he's going for, must never say. And he doesn't seem to know there's things you must, who are ineffable. Never say that somebody's part of a Kennedy assassination. Never. Don't talk about that. That was a part of our history, which is still we're recovering from. And when he talked about that as some, something from the National Enquirer, and the guy's he's reading the National Enquirer for his, his information. <laughs> Reader's Digest was... The Encyclopedia oh, Britannica. Right. <laughs> and it's horrible that he actually thought it, and someone of his opponents says he believes this stuff when he says it. That's scarier than being a liar. But Chris, you know... Now, don't you... interrupt that great thought, okay? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that great thought. You stopped on my line here. Just give me... Count to three. One, two, two three. Go. Here's the brains. Yeah. <laughs> no, finish your thought. No, I had it. <laughs> <laughs> now you made me for... Oh, Hillary was... Uh, I mean, Donald Trump was not good at these Republican debates. I, what was interesting to me, after every Republican debate, I'd walk away and say, gee, Donald Trump didn't really have a great night. When they were talking about details of substance, he kind of backed off, and he wasn't very involved in it. And so my question to you is whether that can occur when he's, there are just two of you on the stage. And it's Hillary Clinton who is all about doing her homework and substance yeah. and everything else. And Donald Trump, who is all about something else. Yeah, uh, uh, Chris, along those lines, uh, uh, all of you, I, I mean, speak to this phenomenon, because the reality is that those of us, you know, that uh, know Bernie Sanders, 74-year-old uh, socialist, who, you know, wasn't that involved in the House side, when I served with him uh, on the Senate side, was kind of isolated. Nobody ever expected that he would come out uh, and have the appeal that he's had. And Trump, the same thing. Everybody wrote Trump off. And so there is something going on in this country in which there are a lot of angry, frustrated people who are responding to, to, to Trump's you know, histrionics, uh, what he's saying, what he's doing, and the same thing in many ways to Sanders and what he's, you know, addressing. So what's, what is that something, that pulse out there? What, you know, what, define it for, for us. Well, I think one part of it is, uh, now, if you're very progressive, you'll hate hearing this, but it's true for both Bernie and Trump, a sense of joy. When people come out of those rallies, I don't know if that's the right word, they're happy. They feel like they've done something. And Trump talks to the person who's frustrated in a different way than Bernie does. The most people out there say, life's been tough. Not this audience, maybe, but a lot of people go, life's been pretty rough on me. I've lost a few jobs. I may be divorced. I, things haven't worked. The kids aren't doing that well. They're not launching. And life, for a lot of people, is rough. And it usually has to do with the workplace. It has to do with the ability to make a living in this country. And things have changed. We've lost a lot of technology. I mean, we've lost a lot of manufacturing. All that's changed. We've been, so Trump comes to that guy, usually a white guy, and he says something to the guy. You haven't failed. Your country has failed you. Don't feel bad. We've been shoved around by the damn Russians who tell us what they want to do to us in Eastern Europe, and they talk about their gas and everything else they got, and they shove us around. The damn Chinese do the same to us. They manipulate their currency, manipulate us. They sell their stuff to us. We can't sell anything to them. The Arabs won't pay for the price of funding terrorism. You don't even know if they're in, in it or not. They won't lift a finger. We've got to send our boys over there and our women over there. Look, the Mexicans think they can laugh at our border. The Canadians, well, they got Ted Cruz, I mean. 
He is after everybody. He knocks, he talks as a nationalist. Our country's been shoved around. It's not just you. Our country's been shoved around by everybody. The Europeans won't pay for NATO. We've got to pay for it. We've got to pay for everything. South Korea's defense. We're paying for everything. We're chumps. We're getting shoved around. And I'm going to shove back. And the average guy out there has been voting for that. And you may not like it, but there's a gut to it. He always got no gut message. But that guy's got a gut message. When he says make America, I understand what offends people, because sometimes people think, oh, it means the early 50s, the all, all white power structure. But it's, I think it's something else. It's a sense of America being what it was coming out of World War II, the country that won. That won. And I think he sells it, and he's crude and terrible, and he says things about people. So I don't want to defend him, except maybe the monkey type Merry Christmas here. Maybe somehow this guy said the thing that connects with a lot of working guys out there. So going into the general, there are not enough working guys like that to win for him. Uh, one time I was working as a cop on Capitol Hill. It was my first job before I got all these fancy jobs, and I was a patronage cop. And I hung out with a lot of West Virginia guys, uh, two, uh, what do you call it, double dippers. I got to know them. And one guy, Leroy Taylor, had been an MP. And Leroy called me aside. I was the college kid. And he, he called me aside, and he said, you know why the little man loves this country, Chris? Because it's always God. I've never forgotten that, that gut patriotism of the working guy. And Trump, fairly or not, has tapped into that gut, gut patriotism. Nationalism, it's the America before the Declaration of Independence, before the Constitution, before any of that good stuff. It's the America we took from the Indians. That's what he's rooting for. That's who Trump talks to, that nationalism, the country we took, this place. We own it, and we're going to fight for it. He knows how to talk, and it's not going to be 50 percent, but... Fascinating bit of history we're living through, I think. You know, you know Chris, that, that, that's a great assessment. I, I, that, that gut, speaking to the gut. And, 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 you know, I can look at the last 10 years and I understand people's anger. I, I'm mad. I, I remember the 2008 meltdown during, during that time when we had um, investment bankers. We had Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac that was running amok. And I had led the charge for five, six, seven years trying to get reforms with Fannie and Freddie. And the argument was, if ever there's a, if ever there's a blip in the housing market, Fannie and Freddie would destabilize the greatest economy in the world. Well, we had a blip in the housing market, and then you looked at it up and down the food chain. People were distorting appraisals. I mean, you know, putting people in homes that should have been $500 a month. It was. Fifteen, seventeen hundred dollars a month, and, and and it went on and on and on. And you know what? At the end of the day, people were upside down in homes. Their credit scores were ruined. Their uh, their their credit w w was ruined. And you know, everybody that was involved in that, they walked. So I I understand that anger. Uh, but on the flip side of that coin, with with, with someone like me, I, I'm concerned. W how we deal with with our anger when when you have I understand appealing to the gut and again it's a great assessment but appealing to the gut and, and, and saying to someone you know punch them in the mouth and I'll pay the legal bills um, you know just um, so, some you just when someone when you disagree with someone you you just are liars and you, you kind of take on a, a bullies mentality and, and for someone I just I said earlier today I just released my second book on March 7th uh, dig deep seven truths of finding the strength within and yes that's a, a shameless plug for you to go buy it <laughs> but 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 the fact is and 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 I I said to my colleagues earlier there's no one in Washington Republican or Democrat that would consider me a hostile black guy or an angry black guy. I, I just know words matter. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. It's the biggest lie that's ever come down the pipe. Wor words do hurt. Words do matter. And, and when you take just two years ago, not 20 years ago, but two years ago, I'm in a department store and, 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 and I'm being profiled and I established that this security guy was following me and I finally turned around and I said, sir, are you following me? And he said, I'm doing my job. I said, is your job to follow me? He said, I'm doing my job. And so I, <coughs> on, I went back and I said, sir, my wife and I, we're in this store 
people know us here. We, you know, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm in this straw all the time. He said, I don't care if you're the president. I don't know if you meant the president of the United States or the president of the company. <laughs> so I wanted to talk to a manager. I talked to the manager. I told her what had happened. She said, yeah, Mr. Watts, you and your wife, we see you, we see you in here all the time. Well, I went and talked to this gentleman, and when I went to meet him, all of a sudden, he came to me, he ran to me and said, Oh, Mr. Watson, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I said, Sir, I accept your apology. I said, But I want you to know, I've got kids, I've got grandkids, I would hate for them to come in this store and have to go through the humiliation that you put me through in the last 20 minutes. <clears throat> is what Mr. <laughs> Trump's saying, is it encouraging that type of thing. I, I think you have to think about it. <coughs> yeah, I, I think about it, not, not from an, an, a, a point of anger to say that you're a bad guy if, 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 if someone, <coughs> my police, my dad was a police officer. So I'm not throwing police officers under the bus. I'm just saying that somebody has to be the adult and, and stand up and be responsible. And I just think some of the things he does is just totally irresponsible and 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 we all are going to end up paying a price uh, if, if we don't if, if, if we don't speak out on it and say hey let's appeal to the best of who we are on both sides let's appeal to the best of who we are as a nation not the worst of who we are and and I tell you I've I've seen some not so good things on both sides of the aisle in this uh, in, in this presidential election, and it concerns me deeply. Mark, what's uh, what's happening out there in the country? Well, I I, I just say this about uh, Donald Trump: Don't worry if he gets elected uh, seriously, uh, because it'll only be a matter of months before he leaves us for a younger country. <laughs> <laughs> Shields, I, you, we're going to send you to bed with no dinner. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I want to say this, though, in, in, not in defense of Trump, but in, in defense of those who vote for Trump. And that, that's this. Um, we just had a, a Navy SEAL killed, uh, uh, Charles Keating IV. And he was the grandson of Charles Keating of Lincoln Federal Savings and Loan. For those who remember the savings and loan scandal, Charles Keating, the owner of federal of Lincoln's federal savings and loan, went to jail for four years. Eleven hundred people went to jail in the savings and loan scandal, which was one twenty-fifth the size of the bailout. And we sit here today, and not a single one has ever been brought to the bar of justice. And Donald Trump is saying there have been trade deals, and yes, the big picture on trade is impressive. Trade has raised more people out of poverty, and it's remarkable. But there's collateral damage. There's collateral damage if you go today to Ohio, or you go today to Michigan, you go today to Pennsylvania, you're going to see burnt out towns and communities where the jobs have gone and the futures have gone. And Donald Trump is saying, look, you've been screwed by the government. The top 1% has walked. We saw what happened in 2008, as JC described it. And the response of the federal government was, we must find out who did this and give them $800 billion. <laughs> And nobody bailed out somebody who's behind in their mortgage, uh, people who have been <clears throat> foreclosed on. And so there is a sense that the deals have been cut, the investment class has done very well on the trade business, uh, but the people who played by the rules, whose kids joined the military and served, whose kids have gone sometimes four or five tours, 
in the Middle East, in Iraq, in a war that we have no idea what would be victory. We know it's been going on for 15 years. We know there has been no consistent, understandable national leadership on it. We know that there is no sense of national mission. We know it violates America's great rule that war demands equality of sacrifice. We know that all the sacrifice, all the suffering is being borne by less than 1% of Americans. That none of us have paid an extra dime in taxes. We've just gone along as business as usual. And these are the people from whose families and communities and neighborhoods the casualties are coming. The casualties in the economic, the trade picture, the casualties in the war that has no end in sight, or no victory to be determined. The Congress of the United States will not even vote to authorize the use of military force. And so there is a sense, and he's saying, you matter, you matter. Now, I may be the only person who will ever join in the same sentence, Franklin Roosevelt and Donald Trump. <laughs> when Franklin Roosevelt died in 1945 in Warm Springs, Georgia, the train brought his case on back to her back to Washington, D.C.'s Union Station. And the streets of Washington were lined 15 deep as the horses drew the casket from Union Station to the White House. 15 deep, and people were openly crying in a time when Americans didn't show emotions. And the only record we have of it are the print reporters and radio. And a CBS radio reporter saw a very well-dressed man. And he was standing in the street as President Roosevelt's case on went by in the horse drawn. And he was crying. And he said, excuse me, sir, did you know the president? He said, no, no. I didn't know the president, but he knew me. And, you know, that's, that, that's a test of the president. Does he know? Does he know the hopes? the heart, the fears um, of, uh, of the people he, he seeks to lead or she seeks to lead. So that's... Well, uh, you're think. also making the case for Bernie Sanders, by I the am. way, because it is the same yep. discussion when I was in Iowa and New Hampshire and onward with voters. What I was hearing from them, some of whom were deciding between Sanders and Trump, I might add, mm -hmm. was that same sense that they had been mm -hmm. that they had been absolutely left behind. I think the difference is, and this is a question about optimism. And the question is whether Sanders is more optimistic than mm. Trump is. Trump is both optimistic and pessimistic. I mean, he really is. Well, sure. I mean, no, he is. He, no, he's both. I mean, right. you know, I mean, he really is pessimistic about the assessment of where we are, and then it, it's sort of this this un, unexplained uh, make America great again. But uh, me, uh, the, the idea that of the Trump Sanders overlay, forget it. Okay, I worked in 1972 for President Muskie. Uh, you remember <laughs> President Muskie? <laughs> I personally took him from 65% approval to 11%. <laughs> so that, that fall, uh, George McGovern is the nominee. And he picks Tom Eagleton as his vice presidential nominee. And then there's this closure that Tom Eagleton has had electric shock treatments, and he's forced to resign from the ticket. So I have a chance to work. Uh, Sergeant Shriver, one of the most admirable human beings I've ever known in a public life or private life, is picked for the hostage position of being George McGovern's running mate. All we talked to, and this will be an example of Trump, all we talked to that year were Democrats who were disaffected. Mm -hmm. We talked to Catholics, to Jews, to <coughs> Eastern Europeans, to Latinos. I mean, that's all we said. We never saw a white American Protestant in the whole campaign. And I say that because Pat Cadell, who was the boy genius of, uh, of George McGovern's polling, had a cockamamie theory that the Wallace vote 
was available to McGovern, that there was an overlay, because they were both appealing to the alienated, to the outsider. And if there are three Bernie Sanders people <laughs> in America who vote for, vote for uh, Donald Trump, I'll buy you a steak dinner. I really will. <laughs> Uh, we're we're going to uh, turn to the questions from the audience, but before I do that, uh, let me just ask uh, JC, what what happens to the Republican Party? Uh, you know, as, as you know, we we go through this. There's obviously a lot of turmoil now, as you said. Uh, Trump is supposed to meet with uh, the Speaker, and it, that doesn't look like it's going to be a pleasant meeting. He's already said, "I'm I'm not going to change my mind." And, you know, it doesn't look like that will change. As a matter of fact, he suggested that the Speaker should not head up the, uh, uh, the, dep the Republican convention. Uh, so the party, you know, is, is obviously split right now. If, assuming that Trump loses, what happens to the Republican Party? Well, I think the way Mr. Trump approached the Paul Ryan situation, considering that Paul only said he didn't say he wouldn't endorse him. He said, I, 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 I'm not there yet. We need to talk. He never talked to, to, to Mr. Trump. He just said, I, I want to see where we are. How can we, or where are we together on things? How do we reconcile our differences? I want, I want to have that, that conversation. And Mr. Trump immediately went to, um, the, 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 you know, went to uh, saying he can't cheer uh, the uh, the convention. Um, so, Mr. Secretary, I'm, I'm, I'm really not concerned about my party. I'm concerned about my country. And, and you know, we, we, can, we, we, we can figure out the party thing at some point in time, but when you consider that you know, we've talked about the amount of debt that we have as a nation, we've, we've set 19 trillion, I would probably submit to you that we're closer fifty trillion dollars in debt. We've got deficits as far as I can see. Uh, we're not talking about how we better educate our kids. We're not talking about infrastructure in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we get back uh, you know, to where we need to be in terms of our in infrastructure? We, we do have some national security issues that we need to deal with. We're not talking about those things. We're underperforming in our economy. We're not talking about those things. And this unrest now with, with Republicans, it, it, the focus right now is on Republicans. But I would submit to you that this unrest didn't just start in the last seven years. I would take you back to 1992 with Ross Perot in the first, uh, in, in, in the Bush Clinton uh, election of 1992. Uh, that was more on the Republican side, but fast forward to 2004, Howard Dean, we saw it on the Democrat side when, when everybody early said that he would probably be the nominee, and he had so much energy going for him that if you all recall, Vice President Gore, uh, Joseph Lieberman was, was Vice President Gore's running mate, uh, Senator Lieberman, he was running for president, and Vice President Gore endorsed Howard Dean over his running mate because that's where the energy was and it looked like he was, he was going to win. So I don't, I don't think it's just emerged or um, you know, emerged the last seven, eight years. I think it's been, been brewing for probably more than, okay. than 20 years. Mr. Trump and, and Bernie Sanders has just tapped into it at the right time. And uh, Trump's gotten a nomination, and Sanders is still fighting. I think he's going to lose it, but nevertheless, he's still in the game. Okay, uh, let, me, uh, let me then uh, take a break here before we get to the questions from the audience. Uh, and as always, I'd like to recognize members of the question review team, the people that are responsible for selecting the questions that I'll present to our speakers. And if you'll hold your applause, let me introduce them. Uh, Chelsea Adami who's public safety reporter for the Salinas Californian, Julie Copeland, who's city editor for the Santa Cruz Sentinel, Doug McKnight, who's a reporter for KACU Radio, and Claudia Melendez, who's education reporter for the Monterey Herald. If you would thank them, please. <laughs> we also have a group of students representing uh, those who attended this afternoon's program. It was a great program with our speakers. 
Uh, at this time, I'd like to ask all of the students in attendance if they would stand and please remain standing until I recognize the schools that are present. There are six schools that are here uh, being represented, so if you'll rise. Uh, Central Coast High School, the Defense Language Institute, Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey, uh, the Navy Postgraduate School, San Jose State University, and the University of California at Santa Cruz. Thank you all very much. All right, uh, questions. Uh, if you're not inclined to vote for either the Democrat or the Republican nominee, what's the best way to get a third party candidate on the ballot who has a fair chance of winning? Chris? Well, um, I don't like third party candidates, so uh, I'm not going to help you. <laughs> I'm serious. No. Look, I think it's, most people think it's too late right now. It is technically, I think there's a couple deadlines that are coming fast. But the, I haven't heard a whole lot about it happening this year. And I do think that when you go for a third party candidate, you have to accept the collateral damage. You're basically killing the candidate you otherwise would have voted for. And I've watched this, and I heard earlier today Mark made a case for Perot, and, I, and nobody made a case for Ralph Nader yet. Um, it does change the results. And in the end, the way our system works, you have to get 270 electoral votes, or else it goes to the House. And if you want that, I think you're crazy. If you want the House of Representatives to pick our next president, <laughs> under a unit rule of each state getting a vote. So New York, California, by the way, gets one vote. One vote. Rhode Island gets one, you get one. Idaho gets one, you get one. So it's a crazy way to pick a president. So you want to have one of the two candidates, or one, a candidate to get 270 electoral votes. And I think a strong opponent, like somebody like Bloomberg gets in this thing, he might carry Connecticut, but that could screw it up. He may carry a couple states. I don't know. I wouldn't think he'd get more than two or three. No. I, I don't see it. No. You know, Do you think he'd get none? He's going to get zero. zero. Okay, thank yeah. you. I was, lo I was going <laughs> low here, Mark, and you're going lower than me. I mean, some people get in their head, oh, Bloomberg's big time. You know, yeah. back east, that's how they think of the west as being somewhere out past Jersey, you know. <laughs> uh, you know, I agree. Uh, okay, I'm with you, Mark. We're down to two or three states. I'll say one. Okay. I'll, I'm not... But the fact is, I don't know who would do well in a third party race. I mean, you know, I, I think uh, Governor Petraeus, or General Petraeus, was a very, he's a very impressive guy, but he got in trouble with that, with that relationship. I think he was very impressive, so I that I could shake things up. But uh, Colin Powell never went that way. He never went uh, third party or second party, Republican. He didn't do it. So I, I don't, I'm just not happy with this. I don't know any Teddy Roosevelts today. You know, and even he screwed it up for his party mm -hmm. and gave it to Wilson. So what, if you, you have the greatest third party candidate ever, gave it to the other party, and that's what ends up happening. If that's what you want to do, just admit it and vote for the uh, Democrat. There's a group that's actually trying to do it, and one of the people involved is an ultra-conservative, Eric Erickson, uh, who used to run redstate.com. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is the problem. So I was talking to him the other day, and he's like, well, we've got all these people. The problem is they're not a candidate, no, because right. they keep going to candidate after candidate, and nobody, nobody really wants to do it. Um, I, I, they thought at one point that Rick Perry might do it. But Rick Perry just announced the other just day that he's, Trump. he's for Trump, and, and if he were named vice president, he'd be honored to serve. Yeah, so, right. And right. be happy to have a job. But they've thrown, <laughs> they've thrown uh, uh, several <laughs> names around Rick Perry. You've heard Tom Coburn out of Oklahoma yeah. and, and right. several others that, that you've heard. And I think, Gloria, that group is kind of evolving to, um, you know, under no circumstances, Trump, but go vote and vote down line. Well, at this, at this stage of the game, you'd have to just write in the name. There's just no, there's yeah. no way to put together no, an effective right. third party operation no. that's going to be able right. to uh, right. compete in, in each state. I do right. want to say something good about Rick Perry. Okay. One of the great things about our business is you get to see people and, you know, you know it overcomes, it either confirms or repeals what your sort of prejudice or perception is going in. Rick Perry turned out to have a great sense of humor. Yes. Okay. He ran for president in uh, 2012 and ran badly. But he, he, he did, he t told a story about, uh, he said he couldn't figure out why he had done so badly. Um, he's talking off the record with a group of reporters, and he said, I, I just don't know why I did. He said, I, you know, I've been governor longer than anybody in the history of Texas. Never lost an election. 
uh, I was an Air Force pilot. I went to Texas A&M. Uh, I majored in animal husbandry. <laughs> he says, maybe that's the problem, animal husbandry. <laughs> He says, that's what Rick Santorum thinks same-sex marriage is going to lead to. You've got to like a guy like that. I mean, you really do. I mean, All right. Just, just one quick thing on, on the Republican Party, and that is what, what Trump understood is, and the rest of us, me, what I missed, was there were sort of certain principles the Republican Party stood for. That's right. Okay? Republican Party stood for free trade. Republican <laughs> Party stood for liberalized immigration. Republican Party stood for muscular defense policy, interventionist if necessary. Republican Party stood for taming entitlements. You know, might have to take some of the beautiful gray hairs out of Social Security. And what did Donald Trump stand for? He stood for the opposite on every one of those issues. He, he basically confronted what was the Republican creed, and said, no, and he won. I mean, so to this guy, it is a significant political achievement. When you say, what's going to happen to the Republican Party? I don't know what's going to happen to the Republican Party, but it will never be the same as it's been. No. There'll never be those assumptions again that, oh boy, we're, we're all for free trade, and we're all, and we got to tame. I mean, what's he say? I will make sure that Social Security is, there's not a dime changed in it. You'll get every nickel that you're promised, and even more. And Medicare will be funded completely, uh, and we're not going into any more wars. Uh, and, you know, I mean, he's just uh, across the board. Uh, and maybe I'll raise taxes on the wealthy. And maybe I'll raise right. taxes on the wealthy. <laughs> but, 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 you know, in, in, and the minimum wage. Yeah, right. And, and, and I've, I've got a theory. I've done taxes. I don't think you need more taxes, I think you need more taxpayers. <laughs> and so you, you've got to do something to create, you know, to create a job. But, but, but secondly, even before, even before Trump, I think Republicans were struggling with who they are. Oh, yeah. yeah, there's yeah, some yeah, truth to that. I, I, I think, think, you're right, I think yeah. the, the yeah. brand yeah. Has, has been tarnished. You know, you, 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 you know, if you see yellow arches, you think McDonald's. You see red roofs, you think you know, uh, uh, Pizza Hut, there used to be taxes. I mean, it used to be with the Republicans, you, you thought a certain thing. And I even believe before Donald Trump, you know, we were struggling saying, who, who, who are we? And, and I, I believe that's why, again, Trump has kind of picked up the mantle. I agree with you that his, his agenda is not, would not be considered a Republican no. agenda. But in, in terms, I was a Rand Paul supporter, and, and Rand Paul, uh, you know, Muhammad Ali said, you know, if you're the same man at, at, at 50 that you were at 20, he said, you wasted 30 years. <laughs> well, the, the fact is, Rand Paul was saying to Republicans, look, let's learn from what we've done over the last 15 years in Iraq and, and around the country. Uh, you know, I, I, I was with him in saying that, hey, I don't say that we should never engage, but I think we need to rethink how we engage. And Rand Paul didn't make it. He was Rand Paul was talking about poverty. He was talking about mm -hmm. incarceration reform, which I've been talking about since 1996 with the disparity on, on crack cocaine and powder cocaine. That I, When I peeled the onion on that, it was basically, you know, Wall Street types used powder cocaine, um, Main Street kids, folks use crack cocaine. So we finally got something done on that five years after I left, and maybe I was a problem, but we did get something done on it. So Rand Paul was talking about some things that was a little different to be talking about in a Republican mm -hmm. right. primary. Mm -hmm. right. Let me go to the next question. Uh, in order to uh, cover the general election more effectively, and uh, talk to you people in the media here. Uh, what changes must mainstream journalism make so that the public is well served, particularly in light of Trump's domination uh, of the media and social media during the primary? Is, uh, is the media bear some responsibility for Donald Trump's well, success? I, I will say something because that's a question that's always, that's always asked. And I believe that Donald Trump did something we don't see from a lot of candidates. 
And that is, he made himself accessible. He went on television when other candidates were mm -hmm. saying, you know what, I'm the front runner, mm -hmm. Jeb Bush. I'm the front runner, Ted Cruz, whatever it is. Scott Walker. And yeah. Scott Walker, right? Mm -hmm. And Donald Trump uh, figured out very early on that you can actually be listened to and get your point across if you actually talk directly to the American people. It helped that he was a celebrity. I understand that. Uh, and the others and the others are not. And Donald Trump has been in front of the American viewers for, you know, a dozen years, years at yeah. least. Not as long as Chris, but a long time. <laughs> but, but Donald Trump, I a think, has... Point. Very important point. I think he's kind of reset the way presidential candidates will approach their campaigns because by appearing in public, people listen to him. Mm -hmm. And you can't get your point across unless you talk to the public. And so by making yourself less accessible, I don't think you make yourself more successful. By the end of the campaign, when you had 17 candidates, uh, and, and then they started dropping out, mm -hmm. the candidates started to suddenly understand that Trump had succeeded where they had failed. And they're suddenly saying, how about going on hardball? Or how about, you know, uh, going on CNN or how about going on PBS because they understood that he had done something that they did not do suddenly I mean Hillary Clinton is much more accessible now for example uh, as a candidate and so I think that's a that's a lesson we take from this Chris, I think we've, uh, you know I, I think the days of the gatekeeping role of the press is past right when somebody like uh, Johnny Apple the New York Times or David Broder or someone would uh, decide whether you're acceptable or not. And Germán was like this too. You'd write a really important column, and the word would be out, Jimmy Carter's okay. Or, you know, and, and somebody else would write, this guy's a lightweight or something. I think those days of our role is, is not what it was. We don't decide who you vote for. We show you the person. Now, I, I have experimented to the extent I can with the audience size that Trump draws. Sometimes you, our audience goes down when we put them on. Sometimes it goes up. Now, it's not predictable. We try to go in and catch the part of his his speech each night when he's saying something new, something news for it. Then we see the shtick coming, the old uh, Boydville Act, and we cut it off. It's hard to be able to isolate that in real time, but we try to do it. I, mean, I tell you, the cracks against media and the media against Trump are relentless. People all know his problems. You all know his. Don't tell me you figured it out. You're, it's there. We have exposed Trump in every one of his weirdnesses. Everything he said, whether it's about Rafael Cruz or anything he's ever said, we know about it. This country's incredibly well informed about Trump. We really are. There's no secrets. He's out there spouting it every night. So you all are wonderfully able to judge the guy. You want us to keep something from you? Fine. But the way is we've exposed him, and yet people have a very mixed response. In this room, I'll bet there's two or three hundred Trump voters right here. You haven't shown yourself yet, but you're here. <laughs> I have picked you out, by the way. I have been picking out the faces of the men in the first four or five rows. I know who you are. <laughs> I know exactly who you are. And I'll be glad to expose you if you ask. Don't tell your wife. I'll right. be glad to expose you. So it's the, it's the reality. We've tried to let people judge themselves. You're all grown-ups. You can decide. If you think Trump would to be president, vote for him. If you don't, don't. It ain't complicated. Your other option is Hillary. That's it. It's binary. It's steak or fish, as the president said the other night. <laughs> steak or fish. That's what it is. It's the system we've got. It's the business we've chosen, and we're stuck with it. If you don't like Trump, vote for Hillary. And don't tell me you don't know enough about the guy because the media's kept him from you. Or we've covered up for him. We've shown you this guy. I could put, I guess I could put Jeb Bush on the air. But you know what we do every night? Every day. My producer, I got a ton of bookers. Three bookers now. All they do is start the phone calls in the morning when I get into work. And by nine something, everybody's been asked to come on the show. And Trump's the one that might show up. And the other one, Kasich, shows up. There's a few that show up. They're afraid of us. They don't want to come on these shows and be questioned. You think Trump? He's going to be hard for me to get back. But, you know, he's hard. He's just hard to get. But, you know, at least he's come on the show. And I think it's, uh, don't blame the media. Somebody over there is blaming the media. You in the yellow dress, you were blaming the media. <laughs> yes, you were. I saw you. You are blaming the media. Grow up. You can handle it. You can choose. You know what? You know everything you need to know about Trump, right, madam? Yes. yes. So now you don't need any more information from us, right? <laughs> okay. Enough you said. Know, Mr. Secretary, Which, in, go ahead. In, uh, in 1998, when I became conference chairman, and I was in charge of communications and 
and trying to put a message out there that the American people would know what we were doing. There were literally people at the leadership table that thought that we should, as Republicans, we should punish the press. And let's say maybe some reporter had, had given, had, had said something bad about Republicans, and, and, and we had one or two advocates that would say, let's punish them. You know, why are we talking to CNN? Why are we talking to Fox? Why are we talking to MSNBC? You didn't have any problem with Fox. Well, no, Fox. I don't believe that But I, I, just, I just threw them in to be bipartisan. But, <laughs> what did but, Mr. But, DeLay say? <laughs> but they said, we, we should, why are we even talking to them? I said, hey, look, they, they have viewers that have a perspective. I said, I want my, we sent out press releases after the President's State of the Union address, and the next day, because we didn't make the story, I had the press secretary call uh, the folks and say, why did you not print our story? And they said, oh, literally, they said, oh, you wanted us to print that? We've never gotten anything from, from the Republican conference. I said, yes. I said, I want our side of the story to be in the story. And I, I worked the press, and I found the press to be very open to me when I was conference chairman to say, yeah, we'll give you an opportunity to tell your, your side of the story. But we literally had people that would say, don't talk to them, let, let, let's punish them. And my argument was, you know, if, if the pastor's just preaching to the choir, the church isn't going to grow. We need to be talking to red, yellow, brown, black, and white. We need to be talking to liberal, conservative, Republican, Democratic. Let, let, me, let me ask on that point. Has social media changed your totally. impact? In other words, uh, Trump's obviously used Twitter. A lot of people are using Twitter now. Uh, and has social media changed the way candidates communicate with the American yeah, people? Yeah, it's instantaneous. Yeah. It's instantaneous. And the, the, the way Trump is so smart is that he'll tweet something at 10 o'clock at night, understanding that it will then dominate the morning shows mm. and the news cycle. And um, he gets that. And social media has changed everything because nothing sits for more than 10 seconds. Nothing sits. There's a news event that occurs, and we, we hear it Keep instantaneously. <laughs> so, you know, when you ran for president, it used to be that there was an off-Broadway. You kind of auditioned in New Hampshire. You saw how good you were. See, see if you move on. There's no off-Broadway anymore. Yeah. Yeah. You start out on Broadway. And if you're someone like Donald Trump, who's used to playing to a That's big right. crowd and used to being on television and used to and understands the media as well as he does, it's a it's a very big advantage, and he knew uh, how to use it, and he and he still does know how to use it. And he's of it too. He's not. He's right. of it. Right. right. He's on his plane, watching cable all day long. <laughs> it starts with Morning Joe, and he's having his little thing with him now, and he's watching it. He's reacting. It's instantaneous. Yeah. I, mean, I would imagine Hillary Clinton talks to her stuff. Now, what's happening on television now? <laughs> I mean, I don't think she's connected. I remember, and by the way, you know, Mr. Secretary, you know, from politics, you have to be in it. You have to be swimming in that water all the time. When you get an old speechwriter to come back and help the president, nobody wants it. Nobody wants it. You've not been in the, you're not in the water. You don't want campaign advice from outside the campaign. You're not in it. And unless you're in it, you can't talk in the conversation. There's a conversation going on right now, probably on, I'm trying to get my East Coast time, Hannity or something, or O'Reilly. They're having a conversation right now. And somebody will have a conversation after that related to that. And they, and they get up in the morning, they'll be talking to Morning Joe or somebody. And it's a conversation that's going on all the time. And Trump is not doing any briefing papers on that plane. He's listening to that conversation so he can jump in anytime he wants to, mm -hmm. tweet anytime he wants. And that, these other guys are totally back in the 20th century on this stuff. He's there. And, it does, and it's not a brain power thing. He just says, I love it. I want to swim in it. I want to be it. I want people to pay attention to me all the time. And that's Trump. And he's and, a you know, and, and I, I, I think... My personal opinion, I think Jeb Bush or John Kasich probably were the most qualified to be president on the Republican side. But, but I think Bush's campaign was stuck in the decade of the 80s. Yeah. The, the campaign they were running, it was an, an old guard, you know, lock up the money, yeah, lock, lock up, up the, the endorsement. Yeah, lock up the establishment. And, you know, politics has done a 180 
from where uh, it was when he ran for governor last time before. Okay, let's let's talk about uh, money and politics. Unlimited campaign financing and <clears throat> lobbying have appeared to strip the average American of a voice in Washington. Is there any way to fix this? Mark? Uh, the premise is right. Uh, there, there's a sense that money uh, dominates, that big money uh, is uh, uh, listened to, genuflected before, uh, respected and deferred to. Uh, that's right. Um, and this is where I will speak in defense of Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders, uh, to his everlasting credit, uh, has met that premise head on. Uh, it's one that both parties accepted. The Democrats had accepted it. Democrats accepted that, oh, if we, if we stop taking nine, six-figure and nine-figure contributions from very, very wealthy sources, then we'll unilaterally disarm. And the Republicans would win. And Bernie Sanders said, Maloney. Uh, and I'm going to raise money in small amounts. And you know, everybody who's semi-conscious knows, average contribution, $27. Twenty-seven dollars, and he's raised two hundred and thirty million dollars. Um, he raised more than Hillary Clinton did, uh, and he's made it into a very successful political vehicle as well. Because every time Hillary Clinton now has to raise money, she has to go to hedge fund manager to host a party in his beautiful suburban home, and there's the cameras, and just reinforcing the narrative that she is too close and too chummy to Wall Street. But Bernie Sanders has done this and given a sense of empowerment to all these people who, who turn out and, uh, and support him. And the other thing, perhaps most important of all, uh, and uh, he's been criticized for uh, his economic plan. I just say this, he has an economic plan that is different from Republicans. And when you take money from the same people, if you're a Democrat and Republican, you're not going to have a distinct economic policy as a Democrat. It's going to be all kind of merged and mushy in the middle. And Bernie Sanders has, has done that. And I think he's really thrown down the gauntlet to Democrats everywhere. Now, the problem is that uh, he is, uh, uh, he's of the left, but the Democratic Party has moved to the left. Uh, the Republican Party has moved to the right. But uh, make no mistake. The money thing, uh, in spite of Jeb Bush's collapse uh, in the Potemkin village, I always thought it was unfair to say, a President, we couldn't let, let one brother succeed another brother as president. It's worked out very well in Cuba. Uh, and, you know. <laughs> but, you know, that, that was, I mean, I, I think the, the Trump thing, I, I agree with both Gloria and Chris on, on Trump and his agility. Uh, and his, uh, his real genius for contemporary, he's about as deep as a birdbath. Uh, I, mean, I mean, he has said nothing of substance in this whole campaign. Uh, and and I, I really, I mean, he, he speaks in bumper stickers. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, make America great again. Yeah, that's it. I mean, you know, what the hell does that mean? Uh, you know. <laughs> And, you know, you ask him a question, he doesn't have an answer. He, he's, uh, he doesn't issue white papers or policy papers. I mean, the, the guy, he talked about his sister as a federal judge and was establishing her bona fides as a conservative and said, well, she signed a bill as judge with Joe Alito. Sam Alito. Sam Alito. Sam. Joe Alioto. <laughs> <laughs> We're in California. Those days. That's right. But I mean, you know, judges don't sign bills. Uh, you know, I mean, this is, this is kind of like how a bill becomes a law. You know, it pass, passes the House, passes the Senate, and the president signs it. I mean, he's substance free in that sense. <laughs> okay, uh, Gloria, Gloria, let's, uh, let's see your, your reaction. Uh, a few weeks ago, Trump accused the sec uh, Secretary Clinton of playing the woman card. Uh, Secretary Clinton responded by creating cards to sell to donors. Uh, what role do you think gender will play in the general election? 
uh, as Donald Trump would say, a huge uh, role. <laughs> gender always plays a big role. You know, every four years we talk about the gender gap. Right now there's a gender chasm. It's not a gap. And uh, Hillary Clinton is not going to let that go away. And I think that uh, Donald Trump understands, and talking to his people, I can tell you this, they've got a problem. Nobody loves women more than I do, he says. And um, <laughs> I, 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 do, I do believe gender is going to be a huge issue. And by the way, it might have been an issue anyway, because Hillary Clinton's candidacy is historic in this country, right? So it's going to be an issue. The interesting thing to me, in looking at the Sanders Clinton Bernie certainly race, carried Bernie women. Sanders got young women. That's right. And when I was out on the campaign trail and mm -hmm. I was at a Sanders rally, yep. I gathered a, a group of a few young women and I said, D okay, so you have Hillary Clinton running mm -hmm. who could become the first woman president in this country. Mm -hmm. Then, but you're supporting Bernie Sanders. Does Jen? We, of course we're going to have a woman president, yeah. so that shouldn't matter. Mm -hmm. So younger women mm -hmm. think that, yeah, of course we're going to have a woman. Yeah. Don't give me yeah, that, right. play that history yeah. card with You're me. Right. And I found it eye-opening uh, mm -hmm. for me, but I do think gender will be, will be an issue. And we've heard Trump go on about Bill Clinton, and that will be an issue as well. And... Hillary Clinton so far has handled it with sort of a cool disdain, I would, I would call it. And we'll have to see how that goes. Because well, he's going to continue. Yeah, I mean, I, it's pretty clear that Trump, I mean, he was on uh, the news this morning and uh, said, no, no, he said, uh, uh, I think the, the commentator was saying, well, why don't you talk about women's issues? At least you're talking about issues, because he said, I love women, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so he was saying, well, why don't you talk about women's issues? And he immediately went to the enabler issue with, with Hillary, that this is something that you know, uh, women uh, don't support. So he's clearly going to use that kind of issue during the campaign. Is that going to be successful? It's incredibly high risk. Yeah, I mean, it's just high risk. Just talking, forget the morality of it or the truth of it. You're asking um, people to make a leap there. And I agree, he's, got, he's fighting an underdog campaign. He's got to take some chances. Well, this is a Hail Mary that I don't know about. I, I think to get women to think that Hillary's responsible for Bill is just hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's just hard. And I also think that we live in a country where divorce is common, and people do really respect marriages that last, and uh, they just do. They do. We love it when we hear how many years been married? Fifty two. Wow, everybody applauds. I don't know what the years were like, but they applaud. <laughs> <laughs> we just like it. It's like we love marriages, we love weddings, we like people that stick together. It's just basically our social glue. I mean it makes so primordial sense to me. And to go out and say that she's not that she's not that she's somehow responsible for it. I just think it's a hell of an argument that to be making. It's a it's a heroic, crazy argument that I don't think it's going to work, and I, uh, I don't think it's going to, I thought Hillary Clinton, the way she handled the, the, the Michigas, the craziness of 98, the way she handled it, which is kind of with the stoic, like the good wife, although I hated the last show the other night. Terrible. <laughs> Terrible. Terrible. Hated it. Hey, hated it. It was awful. I waited seven years for that. Direct. <laughs> terrible. I mean, it was terrible. Alicia, and get out. I, I to stop. Stop. You can't write. Don't do the show anymore. Yeah. Uh, I did think that she handled it. And the way she stoically said, after the initial denial, and she accepted what had happened, and we realized that she'd gotten a, a full truth thrown at her, I think people said, you know what? Uh, given the circumstance, she handled this better than most people would have handled it. Mm -hmm. She took it with strength, and she went on and got involved with helping Chuck Schumer. Then she had helped New Yorkers invite her up there because she's the only person who could have beaten uh, Rudy. She went up there facing Rudy, thinking she'd have to run against him, which would have been very hard. Mm -hmm. he, gets, he gets out of the race. She wins the thing. She earned it. People would laugh their guts off at him, her losing. Isn't that great? How we lost. She had guts to do that. So I think she's earned her spurs here in a lot of ways. And uh, to just throw it all back at her now is so yesterday. I, I think it's a mistake. It, it, it's it, a real it, if, if, in fact, Hillary Clinton does win, though, it does mean that Bill Clinton's in the White House 
all day, every day, by himself. By himself. Or not. You do have a sense of humor. <laughs> I, I, I agree with you, but what are you going to do about that? I'm not, I don't know. I just don't well, and, and, You know, all marriages are, are I think, different. I think you'll be no doing idea. a lot of assignments over here. <laughs> <laughs> right? I think I'll be doing a lot of assignments overseas. Wouldn't you just love to hear it sometime, just to hear the conversation between <laughs> but, I mean, but, but, no. let me, I but also let me. I mean the political conversation. Let, let me, let me yeah, add, I, I think, you know, Chris, to your point, uh, you may think it's high risk, but he will use it. And, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's, he will ride that horse mm -hmm. through election day. To take, to take Bill out of the race. That's right. That's what he's got. But he, I mean, but, but that's been that's been his his style. Mm -hmm. His style in the campaign has basically been to insult the opposition. And when it doesn't work, he stops. It's interesting. I mean, what, it back it has backfired on him a bunch of times. The Heidi Cruz uh, retweet is a is a perfect example. And then he well, well, I, stopped. Like he he understand it, it, he moves on when he when he has to. Uh, and in that particular case, he did. Now, I think they believe, and I agree with everybody here, it's risky uh, on Hillary, but he is trying to take Bill Clinton out of the picture, reminding people of how tired they are of the Clinton fatigue issue, you know, how tired they are of the Clintons. And he'll do it until he believes it's not working for him. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, but just about the gender thing, because I agree, younger women, I, mean, I haven't talked to my daughter about this enough, I agree the numbers show that... Uh, Right. Women who have been through, like our generation, mm -hmm. has been through it. Women know what it was like to deal with the office, to deal with the promotion problems, to deal with the pay thing. They know it's all real. My wife ran for office recently. She talked about it. She's a, younger than me, but she's been through a lot of this thing before things got better. And I don't, I don't think it's the same for people 20 years old today. I and, I, and I think in some law schools there's more women than men. It's just a different <laughs> thing. But, so I don't think it works. But I do think when they see a guy like Trump going after a woman per se, and what looks like going after her because she's a woman or playing that card, I think there might be an interesting strategic defense thing that comes up. And everybody's going to say, wait a minute, I may not be voting gender, but I'm damn well not going to let a guy vote against, run against my gender. And I think it might be interesting. I, I think it's risky. Please One go. historical note. Uh, in 1984, when Walter Mondale ran against Ronald Reagan, uh, Richard Worthland, Dick Worthland, was Ronald Reagan's pollster. They polled every night. It was one night all year. You recall that was a blowout, 49 states. One night all year where Mondale led Reagan. It was the night of the day that he had chosen Geraldine Ferraro as his running mate. And there was a, a surge of, uh, of feeling. Uh, I had the same feeling myself. I remember it was the idea of my wife, my daughter, my mother, whatever. It was just, it was rather emotional. And as long as she was Geraldine Ferraro, she was fine. And she turned out she was Mrs. John Saccaro. And that was, that became a problem. But I, I say that because you, you can't play the gender thing, the Clintons can't, and not expect that there'd be some reaction on the male side. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the, the, you're, you're going to get tired of hearing she's the victim and she's being victimized. And it's a very, very tricky political path to travel. Uh, and I think, I, I, I don't know if I saw agreement from you, I thought I did, yeah, but I mean, yeah. that, you know, you just can't, you can't make her Joan of Arc um, at the same time she's Eleanor Roosevelt, and yet uh, this poor little Nell uh, in the corner uh, being picked upon. And I just, I think, you know, you get a confusion there and men just say, hey, wait a minute, you know? And, and we're talking about men who feel that uh, they've been left behind and left out of the equation in many uh, Can I just say, when you're a woman, it's hard not to run as a woman. <laughs> of all the cheap shots tonight, that's the best. It really is. I'm not saying she doesn't run as a woman. I'm saying she, if she keeps harping on she's being picked on as a woman, or her campaign oh, yeah. raises that I while agree. he's going after her, he's a vicious, chauvinistic sexist. I just, I, I think, agree. I think I you run the risk of its boomerang. You can overdo it. Honestly. Okay, uh, yeah. who should Hillary and Donald select as a running <laughs> man? <laughs>
McGovern, current senator from Virginia, because Virginia is one of those states you want to pick up. He speaks Spanish fluently, which should help him in the in, in, in Hispanic uh, community in this country. I don't, know how, I, mean, I don't know if he speaks with an accent or not, but I think I hear he's really good. That'll help. He's also clean as a whistle in a state she needs. Uh, 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 Sherrod Brown from Ohio. I think he, in the ideal circumstances, he's perfect. He went to Yale, but he doesn't let it show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's got a rough union kind of voice, or a gravel voice, real union kind of guy. This is not Jerry Brown. Sherry. Uh, Sherry, Sherry, Sherry Brown. Sherry. Yeah. The trouble is that Sherry Brown's up for re-election this year, and Kasich would get their name as replacement. No, he's not up. Portman's up. Uh, Portman's up. I'm sorry, there's another. Kasich, oh, no, Kasich, Kasich would up. get the appointment. No, he would get the appointment anyway, because it would be a vacancy. You're right. So he gets the vacancy. Kasich. So you can't put up, you can't go with Sherry Brown, because Hillary's not going to take Sherry a one. I would do it, but Hillary won't. No, he's just not that wild in the way she does stuff. She will pick. I hope she doesn't pick an Hispanic just to pick an Hispanic. I think that'd be a mistake. I think you got to pick somebody, whoever it is, who people pick somebody you think looks like a president to the guy naming them. Don't pick a John Edwards, never again, or a Sarah Palin again. Never pick another Dan Quayle. Stop this. Stop this boutique VP thing. Stop it. <laughs> Pick somebody you honestly believe should be president. It's your first big grown-up move. Don't do it, because if you do that, we know it's a game to you, because you don't think this person is presidential material. So why are you picking them? And I really think that's a first grade test. And I would look at Tim, and on the other side, uh, for Trump, I would go with, I would go, look, he doesn't have a pick of the crop, because a lot of them are going to say no. He needs, you know, Rubio on a good day is okay. Okay. He seems like, okay. I'm not a big fan, but it might make sense uh, to offset some of the Hispanic problem he's created himself. Rubio would also help him in Florida, although I hear he's not that popular in Florida anymore. But then again, I would go, personally, I'd go with a guy I like, because I just like him, Kasich. I'd pick Kasich as my running and beg him to take the job and promise him all kinds of special responsibilities, anything it took to get him on the ticket, because that gives you Ohio. And that means we start breaking that area of NFL, my idea of a Trump voter is an NFL fan with a red face, big job to run, rooting for a team that probably is losing. Uh, you know, the Bears or the Lions or the Eagles or the Steelers. Um, he said, because I'm the top he guy. That, did he? he did. Uh, he said, I'm the top guy. I'm the, I'm the number one guy, not a number oh, two guy. John. <laughs> 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 well, uh, John just concluded he knew bad by himself. Yeah. <laughs> but I, you know, so I think Kasich would be great. I'm not, I, I after all of this, uh, surprised me if he did it. Honestly, it would surprise me if he did it. I think Hillary should pick Kasich. Shake everything up. <laughs> <laughs> She'll never do it. But that would be the wild thing to do. End this partisanship crap with a big statement. And say, so we're going to try to work together. <laughs> I would try that. Be interesting. Yeah, Mr. Secretary, I, I, I'm not even going to try to uh, <laughs> figure that one out on, on the Democrat side or the Republican side. I will just remind reminders of this fact. Florida and Ohio are not swing states for Republicans. They are must-win states for Republicans. So pick two vice presidents. So, so no, I, I mean, it, <laughs> Kay, uh, no, I, no, I think Kasich would if, if he would do it, but he's been pretty adamant that he's not going to do it. Uh, in in Florida, I, I would think the first rule of thumb is, is to pick a uh, running mate that can win his his state. state. And yeah. Rubio did not win his state, but. You know that I, I, I don't think that's a risky pick. I think I think it would be a good pick, and the importance of winning your state. Everybody thought that uh, the year 2000 at Florida and the Chads that was the mm -hmm. story. I think the story was Al Gore not winning Tennessee. Had he won Tennessee, he would have no been Hampshire? the president. Mm -hmm. How about New yeah. Hampshire? He'd won New Hampshire. He would have won the election. Yeah. He won New yeah. Hampshire. Yeah. I mean, come yeah. on. Mark, so, Mark you, uh, you go along with these recommendations? No, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've known John Casey for 30 years, all right? <laughs>
very quickly, Barack Obama rose to 51% favorable. Why did he rise to 51% favorable? Because people were comparing him to Donald Trump and Ted Cruz. Obama said, look, I haven't been this high since I was picking a major in college. Okay? That was a great line of his. He said it. That's where this figures out. John Kasich looks great because he wasn't Ted Cruz and he wasn't, he wasn't Donald Trump. If you're going to pick on the basis of quality and character and intelligence, that Hillary Clinton ought to pick Tim King. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you all. Please thank our panel.